Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. My name is Erin Baxter, and I'm going to be talking today a little bit about cemeteries. I'm the new curator of anthropology, and we're going to do this for about 20 minutes or so. The, we have uh, panelists on uh, the webinar chat, so if you have questions, do please prop in whenever you uh, have something, and we'll try to answer it. If not during, um, then at the end of the, of the seminar. And um, here we go. So um, welcome, everybody, to basically Colorado cemeteries and a practical guide, which I must say is a great place to go and visit during a pandemic. I encourage you to visit. I'd like to do four things today, um, do a really quick origin stories about cemeteries um, in general and cemeteries also in, at, in Colorado, an overview of how, how cemeteries came into being, how demography and archeology, span my particular interests sort of come into play and the quirks of Colorado cemeteries um, that I think every uh, native Colorado and, and visiting Colorado should know. And finally, I want to say plenty of time at the end for your questions, because sometimes there's lots of really good questions from the audience. Um, so mostly ahead of, um, just ahead of time, I know that lots of people in the world are specialists in cemeteries and archaeology is just one element of that. Um, and particularly the cemetery stories that I think we're all familiar with are the famous individuals like Baby Doe Do Tabor or Jack Swigert or the governors and politicians of uh, early Colorado and the like. That's not what the story is going to be about today. For archaeology, we're going to actually zoom out a little bit and look at sort of arche archaeological cemeteries in the aggregate and looking at populations as opposed to individual stories. But they're both important when we talk about cemeteries in general. So. Um, Here's the upper. All of us, everyone, everyone who's ever lived and who is alive right now, all of us are going to die. Yay. Uh, don't get any ideas, though. Don't do it soon. Um, but because of that, we have to, but we tend not to think about what happens to us after our demise. Um, we know that in the past that 107 billion people have died before. Um, and that's, that's a lot, right? But that's actually probably not even right because we think as anthropology and archaeology gets a little better at this, that death has happened earlier and burials and consciousness of death has happened earlier, even maybe going back as far as Homo naledi. And there's even some question about this, this species burying their dead in cemeteries like the Rising Star Cave, where some individuals were carried into these, these space places and maybe were um, interred purposely. And there's also a big debate about Neanderthals, that sort of next species, a little closer to us in time. Some of us are related to Neanderthals who may have buried their dead, sometimes even with flowers, although that's still a really controversial uh, sort of topic. So if anybody out there wants to go to grad school and look at Neanderthal flower burials, it's, a, it's an open-ended question. So I have to re re uh, revise this to say 107 billion modern humans have died, have drawn breath and died on this planet. That means that in the whole entire world, for every person who is living, those glorious people, there's 15 who are dead. This is great job security for archeology, span but also something to think about as far as thinking of the world in general and the myriad and extraordinary and interesting ways that people choose to dispose of, deal with, venerate, honor their dead. And it's a, an impossible topic to do in 20 minutes, but I'm going to try to do just talk about what we do in Colorado, particularly um, in the historic cemeteries of traditionally Anglo um, European and Latino uh, peoples who have colonized this area. So I'm not talking about indigenous archaeology today, but there's lots of cemeteries in the greater metro area, about 26 some of them not official, some of them in unofficial, but I want to talk just about a few of them today. Um, Columbia, Mount Nebo, Mount Olivet, Riverside, and Fairmont. And I spent the weekend at cemeteries for this very talk, so I've got some brand new fresh footage for all of you. And what's really interesting about 19th century cemeteries is that unlike their European counterparts, Americans kind of pushed back from the notion of churchyard grave uh, cemeteries where the people were buried right next to where they went to church. Um, one, because there were too many of us. And two, we fought some big wars where lots of people died. Three, we suffered pandemics where there were mass casualties. And four, it was thought that maybe it's not salubrious or clean to have so many people so close to where living people are. So in general, 19th century cemeteries were park-like. They were out away from town, places to recreate, take a picnic, visit with the dead and the like. Sometimes they were private, sometimes they were public, depending on maybe the religion or the order of people who were in charge of it. And often they were segregated, sometimes by race, by class, by military service and the like. And we'll see vestiges of that um, today. Now, 
here's a question. It's a question too of space and archeologists keep an eye on this just as much as morticians and politicians do. Given it like every 10,000 people, right? Um, in, in one town, uh, say, or, or say the de this deck of, of Bronco Stadium at Mile High, um, that's about 10,000 people. Here's a representation of a fraction of that. Every year for this number of people, this many people die. And if you can imagine, if each of those people were buried, how much space would they take up? Well, we've done the math on this too. We know that 62 graves take up an acre of land. Okay, so that's a lot of space uh, given over in perpetuity, in, in theory, um, for people to be taking up space. So that's basically a football field every year for every 10,000 people. Now, this is a problem because if you think of the Denver metro area, there's this many people. And then you think yearly death rates is around this, give or take. And then you think the acres needed are about 300 per year for just Denver then you need about this many square feet, which is essentially the size of City Park. So every year, Denver, if we buried every individual in a six by three by you know whatever grave, we would need that space this year and next year and next year and next year. And pretty soon we're gonna run out of space. So it's not particularly a feasible or sustainable model. Um, and this is something that many people have dealt with in the past and will continue to deal with um, and why changes in how we've dealt with people and large numbers of people in cemeteries and and charnel houses and mausoleums have changed through time and we're going through one of those changes right now believe it or not because space in general is running out um, cremation is on the rise colorado is one of the most likely uh, states to, to cremate we're up to somewhere in the 60 to 70 percent range of most people and younger people choose more often to be cremated and inhumations in general are down so this is taking the pressure off the current cemeteries and the like and the space uh, needs and some of the reasons we think for this is an awareness of environmentalism that's maybe uh, the embalming liquids and, and fluids that go into the body, plus the space that's needed and, and the vaults and the things are like, are not great for the environment. That it's expensive. Um, in, in general, embalming and burying somebody is about three to four times as expensive as cremating them. Um, and there's a difference in religious beliefs. So things, large institutions like the Catholic Church have said it's okay not to, uh, it's okay to cremate now. And that was taboo until very recently in the last, you know, generation or so. So there's a source so of there's a cultural change in some parts of the country. There's not. So in particularly religious and southern states, there has a tendency to be a much higher burial rate than cremation rate. But this is, again, something that is changing and fluctuating through time and which we've seen before for these very reasons. The Greeks did the exact same thing in the sixth century. They were like, nope, we're not we're not burying anymore. We're cremating for the very same reasons about space and the like. Um, but this is what's fun about patterns in archaeology is, is looking at tools and looking at these sort of long durée, these big picture ideas of why people do what they do. And it's important to do the microscopic, the analysis of the individuals, but it's also important to zoom out and look at these sort of bigger, bigger ideas. And that's what I would like to do today. So take, for instance, if you guys were going to go to a cemetery and you're like, put on your science cap and I'm going to sort of try if I can see some patterns, you might make some observations like scientists do and notice that there are patterns on the tops of these headstones that look different. And you might say, well, why is that? Or is there a way to discern what this pattern is? And there is, and it's a tool that archeologists use called seriation, which is an analysis of frequency. And it's so simple, it sounds complex, but it's the easiest thing to do. And you guys can do it this week when you visit a cemetery. So there on the left, you've got a death head, and then you've got a cherub, and then you've got a willow and urn. And these were really popular um, markings for gravestones back in the day. So let's say you've got those, you, you make a list of, what, of the factors that you're looking at, those three on the left, and then you put the dates and you divide it up, say in 10 years, something arbitrary like that, of when the cemetery, they appear in the cemetery. And then you do something really easy. You just go and you say, all right, death said, are there any from 1811 to 1820? and you might put a number. And then you might do the same thing for the next and on down. You just make these little lists really easy. And then for the willow and urn, you do the same thing. And again, for the cherub, right? This is really easy. 
super, super refined archaeological technique that you've just learned. It took me years of graduate school to figure this out. And then you make a list, right? So you've got your cherub, your death's head, your willow and urn, and your amount of frequency. Here's where the artistic part comes in. You just do a little line out to the side, like two, five, a little bit bigger, nine, a little bit bigger, 15, five, all the way through. And that's a graph of frequency, right? Very cool. And then you do it for the others as well. And pretty soon, when you sort of start to sort of fin finesse your data, you put them into what is known as a battleship curve. Anybody play Battleship, the board game? You put them into, oh, there's, an, you put them into order and the highest frequency goes to sort of the lowest, earliest part of your timeline. And all of a sudden you, you have a variation in frequency and popularity. So you can say from 1711 to 1720, Holy moly, death's heads were the most popular. And then they lost popularity, right? Just like things go in and out of fashion in our worlds, the same thing was happening in the early 18th century. And then it looks like cherubs showed up and then willows were taking off and were really popular by the time our data ran out. So you have these battleship curves of frequency and you can tell which was popular when and how those sort of changed. And you can make guesses as to why what was popular when. This has to do with the Revolutionary War and the like, but it's very cool. But you can do this with any trait in any cemetery or on any archaeological dig. And of course, the oldest we always put at the bottom. So for instance, you can also use this when you don't have data. So here's a totally made up cemetery that I did. And say you zoom in like on these graves at the bottom here. And you can kind of see I put men and women. And you can see that these um, sort of rectangular tombstones, there's a pattern in general where they showed up that they died in the 1950s, 1940s. See that pattern? Well, what if we zoom up to places where we don't have data, a tombstone with no date, but it's a rectangular tombstone? Could we infer, for instance, that that individual was probably buried in the 1940s or 50s? I think it's a legitimate assertion given our seriation and our pattern recognition from a seriation analysis. And if you think you have to do this in cemeteries with tens of thousands of people in it, it becomes a really powerful tool for analysis. Another thing, if you ever go to a cemetery, think about our classical roots. This country, much of this country was colonized and settled by people with sort of European roots who drew upon those roots when they built their monuments to themselves. So at the top, you have a monument from Pompeii and at the bottom, a monument from 1899, just down the street um, at the Fairmont Cemetery exact replicas, but you might not know that that originated 2000 years before. Same is true when we, we derived lots of our, our tombstone data from, from places like Egypt. Obelisks were incredibly important for pharaonic symbols and history making in Egypt, and they're 3,500 years old or, uh, or less, but they became super popular. There's George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison, all had obelisks for their markers. And if you look at the Washington Monument, you can see how much influence this ancient culture uh, influenced the United States. And this trickled down into places like the Riverside Cemetery in Denver. And this is sort of Governor's Row, where even though these were in the 1870s, a little bit later than what our United States presidents were doing, you can see that there are obelisks, large and small, every shape and size, emulating what the ancient Egyptians had done. And so too in Boulder, this is like sort of the common man sort of version of an obelisk. And you can see this is on the hill. For those of you familiar with Boulder, there's hail sciences in the back and a miniature obelisk is here in front of Mr. Upton who died quite young. So too do we get um, uh, sort of practices from the ancient Greeks. On the left, a sixth century BCE image of a small child holding a dove. And on the right, we see small animals, uh, ewes and lambs and doves with sometimes with broken wings meant to represent the death of a, of a child. Um, so this is a 2000 year old tradition or more that's practiced by 21st century and even 19th century Americans. Cyrus the Great, sixth century BCE, Achaemenid Empire. There's his tomb on the left and here's Fairmount and Mount Olivet looking very similar, maybe with a couple of Greek and Roman columns thrown in for good measure, but very rooted in the classical world. So we are, I mean, living and dead and ongoing history all happens at, at a cemetery. And 
the other thing that I love to do is about cemeteries is again, demography, this big picture idea. And this is, okay, a lot of tables don't get put off by this, but this is students from the University of Colorado Boulder who've gone out and they've looked at hundreds of tombstones and they've compiled them and they've put everybody into one column. So over on the left, if you're zero to one, they have a statistic here. And basically what that means is your probability of dying when you're zero to one year old or one to two. And as the numbers get higher, the more likely you are to, to not do well. So if you all look at this, you might be able to scan through and see when it's a dangerous time to be alive. And that's when you're being born, when you're being weaned. And I, I cut off the data a little bit, but it, you're, you're golden basically from age about three or four after you've, uh, after you've weaned from your mom. And then things get dangerous again when you're a teenager. And this is people from 150 years ago that these data represent. And it's really actually pretty relevant and pretty common to have similar patterns in, in mortality rates for these, these age groups now. And that's a really interesting pattern that you can do this for anywhere. And you can do your seriation um, mapping um, to, to find this out yourself, which is really fun to do. Um, and then, so things that are like life expectancy, these are things that my students have worked on as well. We all know that in general, women live longer than men. There's basic physiological and biological reasons that is. There's about a three and a half year age difference for most people in Boulder. This is where the data come from. Um, and those are for married people. If you're a single lady, you live longer. If you're a single man, things are looking a little more bleak. So these are interesting sort of demographic trends, um, which I don't think hold quite as true um, for modern people, but are still nevertheless interesting as well. The other thing they studied was what happens if the man dies first and very likely of couples, the, the woman uh, carries out the, the tombstone purchase and the like. Well, in general, my students did an analysis of decoration for men and women who were married. And if the woman died first, you get tombstones like this on the left. There are high levels of decoration. They're well planned out. And then if the, if, uh, the woman dies first and the man uh, oftentimes, not always, but often um, de determines what the tombstone will look like, things are a little more simple and not as um, ordered would be one way to look at it, which I get it. You know, there's, there's clearly sort of an aesthetic sort of taste or monetary sort of consumption about spending that money on tombstones. Nevertheless, a really strong and interesting pattern um, that carries out through the last 150 years at these cemeteries. Um, in general, women get to be depicted slightly differently. So here we have the Smith's tomb. There's Albert at the top, lawyer. And when we look down at Ida, she's Albert's wife. And that's pretty typical of a, of a 19th century 20th century burial. Um, if you notice any pattern here, I know I did a some really bad camera work on the right, but um, you'll notice that couples often are represented with the male on the left and the female on the right. And there's a reason behind that. It has no rhyme or reason to who dies first. It has to do with, well, basically how we are levels of government. So here are John Adams and Abigail Adams in their uh, crypt in Braintree, you can see John is on the left, Abigail is on the right, and that comes from um, our monarchical past where kings always sit on the left, queens on the right. The exception is Queen Elizabeth though, by the way, so that doesn't always hold true, but we, we have these sort of roots and where we're even placed at death um, on our histories. Um, when you go, if you go to a cemetery, do look for monuments that look unfinished, columns that are broken, things that are covered over or the like, trees that are cut off halfway, those are meant to represent a life cut short. Those often represent young adults who didn't sort of live out the long life that they were meant to have. And there's also monuments that you might find sometimes for small children that have the doves and the broken wings and the like, but sometimes slightly older adults have incredibly extraordinary, big overwrought tombs. And these are what we call differential levels of grief. And we might think, kind of distantly, coldly, not, not meaning to be cold, that a, an older person's death is for somehow less sad than a younger person's death. And often when a parent is still in a young person's life at their death, they, they overspend or they, there's these, these great levels of outpouring of grief that are manifest in these oversized and overwrought monuments maybe that 
we might not normally see for an individual. So these are two teenagers um, who are in the Riverside Cemetery. People also look, we're in secret societies, so look for enigmatic markings on tombs, like the upper left, those are Masonic symbols of old, old society. These go back centuries. Over on the right is the um, orders of odd fellows, and those FLTs and chains means friendship, love, and truth. There's, there's also the woodcutters of the world on the lower right, and there's even female versions. Women could be in some of these versions um, uh, as well, and they're sort of in the center there. Um, but do keep an eye on those. And my students have studied this, and in general, if you belong to a secret society, you tended to be healthier, wealthier, and your monuments tended to represent your affluence. So it, was, it behooved you, at least in death, I imagine as well in life as a proxy to, uh, to have belonged to one of these. And there was a reason behind it. And maybe why we're in, in clubs and social organizations now. So we have networks of people to whom we can rely on. Just like now, shops in Denver, if you wanted to buy a tombstone, you could buy local or you could order out to the Sears and Roebuck. And you can see that the local shops kind of ordered out as well. But from this, you can find patterns and you can figure out how much people spent on tombstones and whether they got it from Sears and Roebuck or whether they got something a little more local, which tended to be of not as good material in Colorado and not as well carved. So you look, look for patterns there as well. And finally, you might see that people are often, many tombstones in the United States are facing towards the east, right? And these, this is a reason is because they're facing basically where the three major religions of the world are. And this is very important for, uh, or I thought it was for Christians, although some data show it's not, and for Jews. Uh, there aren't that many samples of people practicing um, uh, Islam, so I'm not as sure for Colorado historical cemeteries, but in general, most headstones face east. Most, but not all. And the idea is, is that you, on Judgment Day, you can sit up and you'll be facing the right direction um, to see whatever deity is coming back to sort of save you. But if you can tell in Fairmont Cemetery, some face that way, some face this way. Um, and some face are in a circle. If you go to Mount Nebo, where everyone is um, practicing Jew, then they all face east. So there's much more rigor in where you're uh, oriented. And that's also a clue in sort of determining maybe um, the religion and ethnicity of individuals. Some people say it's because they're facing roads. If they're not facing east, they might be facing local roadways. Some students think that, hey, they're Coloradans or they at least spent a time in Colorado, right? And they want to look at those glorious mountains and many face to the west. Um, so final, I want to land on this slide, which is sort of the final, if you live in Colorado and you're dead in Colorado, there's some really interesting things about our state. If you want to embalm, cremate, or prepare a body for death, you don't need a license, coursework, or training. You can start a, a, a business tomorrow. Um, we're the only state in the country that does this. Um, and there have been some repercussions for this. And I think there's some interesting conversations to be had about it, but uh, many local morticians and funeral directors do have um, licensures in other states, but Colorado does not require it, which I think is interesting. If you're, if you're dead, you know what? You can be buried anywhere. You can be buried in whatever backyard you wish to. You only have to notify the city um, within 30 days and probably recognize that your property value will decrease dramatically. And finally, don't worry too much if you find a tombstone in your backyard. It's a phenomena. I know the Cheeseman Park thing is a, is a different phenomena. But for instance, just a couple weeks ago, a tombstone was found on my street that I live on, on Ivy. This is courtesy of Stephanie Teal. And there was question as to sort of, was there someone underneath her backyard um, or the like? In general, most archaeologists who work in cemeteries realize that tombstones fall out of use, they get broken, and they get repurposed and used in, in, uh, in houses and, and gardens and the like. So don't worry, 99.9% .9 of the time, there's not uh, something in your backyard. And that's it, you guys. Do you have questions? I'm sorry, I, I don't see on the feed. Hit me with your questions, memory. Yeah, here I am, Erin. <laughs> We do have some really good questions. I was just looking. And hi, everybody watching us live. My name is Memory. I just popped up. Um, but I am just here to read your questions to Aaron. So let's see what they are. 
So we have one from Talia. Talia asks, are we seeing a rise in other forms of burial or body disposal like cryogenic freezing? And are there any forms of burial, burial that are not advisable or legal? Oh, wonderful question, Talia. Yes, we are. We're seeing biodegradable and green sort of burials. Um, we're seeing lots more donation to science. We're seeing people who are cremated and part of their ashes are sent to space. You can be pressed into a record you can be pressed into a diamond or other forms of jewelry. You can be recycled with high pressure water. Um, you can be planted with trees and flowers and the like. Um, some of my students have, have um, realized that you could be cremated and rolled into a smoking apparatus of sorts, which is less legal th than I'm aware of. Although actually, I actually know this, cannibalism is not illegal in 49 states. You can't do it in Idaho, um, but that would be maybe uh, not advisable um, to inhale your, uh, your deceased friend. Um, but yes, there are a variety of ways and, there's, and they're all becoming more affordable and more environmental friendly every day. Awesome. Okay, we got another question from Leanne. Yes. She asks, do you have recommendations of interesting small town cemeteries to visit? Oh, I was just at, well, small town, I was just at Riverside Cemetery yesterday in north of Denver, and it, it was really wonderful. It, um, it has a whole variety of people from the Denver's very beginning all the way up into modernity, and it has variety, and it also has an, a number of notable people like Simon Sewell, who was a objected to the Sand Creek Massacre um, and the like. Another is the Columbia Cemetery in Boulder. I don't, don't know if you think Boulder is a small town cemetery, but that is also a pioneer cemetery that has the sort of the most um, variety of tombstones and the and, and notable people that you might uh, recognize and might find interesting. Great, we're getting some good questions. Okay, Diego asks, can you speak a bit about segregation in cemeteries, specifically at Riverside? It seems there are areas for different immigrant groups. I think you're right. And I think you actually find that there's not necessarily immigrant groups, but it's also military and the like. Um, I'm not familiar with Riverside as much for the segregation. I know there are like Catholic cemeteries um, at Mount Olivet and Jewish cemeteries at Mount Nebo. And then there are sections in Fairmount where you find sort of Jewish folks and you might find descendant communities like there's a, there's a whole Ukrainian community. I know there's, there's a Japanese and a Chinese community. Um, and I think that that has more to do with families purchasing plots or purchasing areas in, in group or in bulk, like a family might buy five or six plots in a row, then it is an overarching sort of cemetery association saying you must bury here or there. So it's, it's, um, it's divided, but I think it doesn't have the same sort of negative connotation of segregated. For instance, the, in most cases, like in the Boulder Cemetery, you're more often segregated by whether you can pay or not than what your color or religion or um, sex is per se. So if you were poor, no matter what the, oh, those other characteristics you were, you were put in the Southeast corner and what is known as sort of the potter's field, the poor people area. Um, but beyond that, I think the, uh, the segregation comes from self-selection from family plot. Awesome. And we're gonna be a little bit over, but we have time. Let's do one more question. Great. Erin, um, this is from Danani. She asked, what is the most eco-friendly way to dispose of a body? What a good question, Danani. I would have to say probably the, the, the burial um, where you turn into sort of a tree or a mulch or a plant is the one that I think is the most eco-friendly at this moment. But I know there's lots of organizations developing sort of um, making you water soluble and turning you into mulch. I just don't think it's become quite mainstream yet, but I know tree burials right now are probably the most economical and the most environmentally friendly. Well, awesome. Well, let's get on out of here, Erin. Go visit your local cemetery. It's good times, you guys. <laughs> Thanks very much for listening. Take care.